Hi, my name is Lisa, and I'm from the United States of America, Los Angeles, California, on the West Coast. We have started a nonprofit charitable organization worrying solely about desert climates. The desert now covers one third of the entire earth, which is an unbelievably large area. And in that area, no food and no vegetation grows. That includes the Arctic areas, the cold areas, the urban areas, the cities, and the desert areas with the heated terrain. In those areas, no food grows and certainly there is no water. And that is very dangerous because without vegetation or trees, the wind can go as high as 100 miles an hour, if not more, and uh, right through the desert because there's nothing blocking the wind without vegetation. Therefore, the deserts are not just necessarily one third of the earth, but they're growing at an alarming rate to becoming greater, greater territories and greater, greater areas covering the earth. The sands from the Sahara Desert winds grow, um, blow so hard that a thousand miles away in Senegal, they see sands on the top of their buildings. The sands from the Gobi Desert blow so hard that people in Asia have all kinds of respiratory problems. The machinery is always breaking down. The sand is found all the way across the Pacific Ocean in San Francisco, full of pollution, which is caught up when the sand goes up into the air and locks in with the particles in the air. And uh, it's been known, it's been stated and found that in the China Gobi Desert, children can be picked up off their feet, thrown feet many feet away and buried alive and they have not been found at times for weeks the deserts are petrifying and when the issue of global warming which is so prevalent today and um, food sustainability which is so prevalent today are brought up the focus of that discussion must always be on the growing deserts in uh on earth. We focus our study on any way we can to improve the quality of life for desert people, somehow stimulate the pollinators, the animal kingdom, which are the natural procreators of the earthly vegetation, and somehow find out what it is they need to be happy and healthy and get back to work again to bring our environment back in the areas of the desert. What makes sense is to think of the areas at the outskirts of the desert where there is still greenery and there is still life and to stimulate the pollinators, the birds, the bees, the butterflies, the insects, the gophers, the snakes, the rabbits, the groundhogs and all those interesting little people and say to them, what is it you need to keep you healthy and productive on the very outskirts of the desert so you won't be consumed necessarily by the desert, but you can do your work to perhaps start there and walk, work inward from there, bringing good tidings to the areas that are not doing so well. We have a plan. We feel it's successful. We have some test models in place in Los Angeles, where it's a very heated desert area, in Kenya and in Nigeria. And in all those areas, we found rainfall from our work, cooler climates, fog, uh, migrating exotic birds, uh, healthier soils. We're finding amazing results. The hardest part is thinking of the, the very, very terrifying places like the Tar Desert, in uh, the Indian area, the Gobi Desert in China, the Sahara Desert in Africa, and of course, any place where terrifying deserts exist. We also have a lot of thought for Australia. We do everything we can. It costs money because we hire people um, who are not necessarily making much money and where food sustainability is low, where there is poverty, we pay them a few dollars. It goes quite a long way. And we ask them to simply buy bird seed and put out w good water and nuts and fruit for the gopher population. And we start with little families and we also provide money for gas for people who have uh, transportation so they can get out to their neighbors and spread the word. The best solution is for every neighbor in every home across the United States and, in, and all over the world, and especially in desert areas, to put out bird seeds and bird nectar and water and all kinds of food and, and gopher food planted and buried under the sand 
because that's where they live in the heated areas underneath the ground. And we're asking people to join us. If you have table scraps and water, it's very simple to put out a, a bird bath or a water feeder or some fruits and nuts if it's something that's left over. Or you can make it a habit to fill your bird feeder every week and your nectar feeder every week and your bird baths every week and to consider the gopher population. There are always flowers that can be planted to bring in the butterflies. They like milkweed and they like flowers and they, they do drink nectar. There's a thing that you can do. We are finding families everywhere in the desert areas on the outskirts of the, des the deserts to start our work, maybe help them or if they can do uh, it themselves without our help, we're not heavily funded. We don't have a lot of money, but anyone anywhere could put out bits of bread or bits of seed anywhere, or certainly water. And there's always something anyone can do from any home. Our animals are precious to the earth and we should care for them. Whether we have money in our so much money in our pocket or not, they are part of our earth. Without them, we'll die. And there is such a thing as animal extinction going on right now. It's important for us to make sure that that does not uh, consume uh, our lives with a terrible re result. I hope that I can start getting funding for my organization so I can start paying families who are poverty stricken to start doing the work on the outskirts of the desert and then use some of the funding to, to travel and educate their neighbors so every neighbor will start doing their share in their own backyard. I believe it's time for the backyard environmentalist to save the world in, in, from home to home, creating a network of people joining together to save our planet from global warming and also lack of food sustainability. Thank you.